one uh, example, I guess, that's occurring to me um, in terms of ultimately what, what, why we're doing this, right, is to get a shift, to get something to get something to change. And the example that's occurring to me um, was some research that Anne Summers did that people may have heard about called violence or po the choice, violence or poverty. And it, was, it came about with looking at the significant proportion of single parents who are women who've left domestic violence situations and who are on that, getting that single parenting um, benefit, which was cut. And that's an example to me of like a, a gender lens that was predominantly women who are affected, single women who come out of domestic violence situations. And it's also, to the point earlier, it was a combination of a powerful piece of research that required access to data that was difficult to get and all that sort of stuff, powerful piece of research. And then the voice of, to Joe's point, those women getting access because there was a policy champion with a, you know, a position of influence like Anne Summers who could get in the doors of, of, of Parliament, but also it was the voices of those women who were impacted by that policy decision to reduce that single parent or to stop that single parenting payment younger. So that whole combination, let alone the women and many others I'm sure who, who would have battled for this over many years, but that combination of things um, to me speaks to both the previous conversation about what it takes. So you need the people who bang down the doors and, um, and you need um, yeah, and you need to pay attention to it, what issue is most affecting people because of their gender in this case. Yeah. yeah. And just picking up on that, I think that that is the report where Anne acknowledged that the data that were available was not inclusive of um, gender diverse people, which goes to my earlier comment about, and that's something that, that all of us who are academics and in, in the sciences and social sciences need to to address, it's you know, it's not good enough to just say, oh, quantitative research means that we're never going to find out anything about a certain group. First Nations people in particular have pushed back against that for a very long time, quite rightly, and we need to, to do work on that. But to your question, um, I, I mean, I commented in my first, our first round of discussion that there is clear evidence that, you know, if you invest in women, it creates outcomes for a lot of people. I mean, you know, there's a glib thing if you give the man a fish, if you, you know, if you give the man a fish, he eats for a day, and if you teach him how to fish, he, you know, eats for his life, and then if you give a woman, if you teach a woman how to fish, then the whole village gets fed for life. <laughs> um, but for anyone for whom that feels a bit uncomfortable, I feel a bit uncomfortable about that, because that's gender stereotyping, right? Um, but, that, you know, that it, it is a consequence of the way we're socialised. It's yeah. not a consequence of who, you know, what's right or wrong. It's, it's just how we're socialised. But... Um, but I do think to, you know, Sally's comments on the brave conversations and, you know, I, it's fairly clear in the way I speak how I feel about things. Um, the power does need to be ceded. It's not, you know, it, it isn't just the case that we invest in women and we have radical transformation and everyone is better. I mean, I think we're better. I think when we are inclusive and diverse that we have a more innovative system, that we have a more just system, and I think that that creates collective value. But it's not going to be completely without, you know, some disruption to power structures that have persisted for a very long time and allow for, um, you know, the comfort of uh, particular social groups. And I think that's one of the things that, that is challenging, you know, I think... We know social movement um, research shows very clearly that humans get together when they feel an immediate threat to their lives. And so the pandemic example that you gave, Sally, is that example of where collective action happens spontaneously because we feel at risk. Um, it's quite hard to uh, generate that kind of collectivism in a context where we don't feel like we're all experiencing the same risk together. Uh, and I think that's one of the ongoing challenges of this work um, is uh, being able to be brave, to um, disrupt, and also to provide, to recognise that we need to find the means by which we address the disruption and the discomfort that that creates for people who, people or groups, who, I should say, not people, but groups who've experienced privilege and and you know and um, the status quo is actually preferential.